Now, if you have your Bibles tonight, would you please turn with me to Revelation chapter 6. Good to see all of you. We're going to finish... Lord willing, this sixth chapter tonight, we'll do a little bit of review. If you haven't been here, I'll give you a crash course and try to catch you up. I want to remind you all the messages that we preach here. We post them on YouTube. Just look my name up on YouTube. I have a channel. You can subscribe to it. and You can listen to these as you like. It's just the audio of these messages. It's no uh, video recording, but... Uh, I believe it will be a blessing to you. All the Revelation teachings are on there. And it will be good to go back if you miss some. And it it will catch you up to where we are. We're going to begin reading tonight in Revelation 6 and verse 9. Tonight we're going to deal with the fifth and the sixth seal that's in the scroll that Jesus Christ is opening in heaven. It says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them, that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it was rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains." And they said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of Him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of His wrath is come. Who shall be able to stand? Will you pray with me as we get into this teaching tonight? Father, we come once again in the name of Jesus. And God, we thank You for Your Word. God, we thank You for the warning that it brings. Lord, we thank You for the truth that it carries. And Father, we pray tonight that this Word, it would be weighty upon us, that it would be heavy upon us. And Lord, that You would let us be, as You say in Your Word, Noah was warned by You and he moved with fear. And he built an ark to the saving of his household. Lord, let us take this warning And let us move and walk in the fear of God. Lord, that You've put us here to be a light in a dark place. Lord, to be a a, a voice of hope. Lord, to be a voice of love and mercy and power in the earth and especially in our community. Lord, let us be about the Father's business. I pray tonight that You would anoint the reading, the preaching, and the hearing of the Word of God tonight. Give us ears to hear and a heart to receive. We ask it in Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Uh, I want to give a quick introduction by way of review. As I've already stated, we're in the sixth chapter. By the time you get to the sixth chapter, you're in the early stages of the Great Tribulation period, a seven-year period. We know that the, the Great Tribulation is a period of time that God has destined and ordained to deal specifically with the nation Israel. Right now, uh, most 
Jews are, they reject the Messiah. They reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. They believe in the Old Testament. Many of them do. But they do not believe that Jesus was the Son of God or that He died to be the Savior of mankind. They rejected Him. They delivered Him up. Crucify Him. Give us Barabbas. That, that's really where their heart is today. The seven year tribulation period, really the, the last three and a half years of that, God is going to deal very severely and harshly with the nation Israel. It will result in them being surrounded at the battle of Armageddon, surrounded by a man we know as Antichrist, and just before they are completely annihilated. Understand, Zechariah tells us that in the great tribulation, two out of three Jews are going to be killed. There's only going to be a small amount of people left. Just before they're annihilated, the Bible says they're going to look up to heaven and say, oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Immediately after they begin to cry that out in the eastern sky, it's going to split open. Revelation 19 says that Jesus comes riding back to the earth on a white horse. He's got a vesture dipped in blood. He's got a name that is is holy and true. Out of His mouth is a sharp, two-edged sword. He crushes the enemy armies. He crushes the armies of the Antichrist. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. It will be split in two. That is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you understand? All through the Bible, great promises are given to the nation Israel. God has promised them the land. God has promised to restore them. God has promised that they they will live in peace and that Jesus Christ, He's given this promise that He will sit on the throne of His father David. He he will rule the world in righteousness. When we come to the book of Revelation, we take a futuristic view. What's that? That just means it hadn't happened yet. Be careful the people that you read. There, there's so many, so many views, so many theories on this. Some people believe now we're living in the millennial reign of Jesus. That this right here is the kingdom of God. I, I don't believe it. I, I believe the, the Bible says that Satan is the God of this world and he blinds men so that they can't see the light that shines uh, in the face of Jesus. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, the earth is the Lord's. And the fullness thereof. This earth belongs to God. But this world system, all of its corruption, the political agendas, the horrible things that you see on the news, the horrible things that people do, all of that is Satan. All of it is the product of sin. Jesus is going to come back at the second coming and He's going to set up a literal kingdom of God on this earth. Jesus Christ Himself will sit on a throne in Jerusalem. There'll be no sin in this world. There'll be no rebellion. And there'll be none of that. Satan will be bound, the Bible says, in a bottomless pit, chained there for a thousand years. Ain't it going to be a good time? Amen? That's what the people of God will enjoy. Well, getting up to that, in the book of Revelation, John is a prisoner on an island called Patmos. It's off the coast of Turkey. Um, known as Asia. He says the seven churches which are in Asia. It's not Asia, the continent like we think about. It's a little piece of ground which really encapsules modern day nation of Turkey. He's off the coast of there on an island called Patmos. He's a prisoner. But he says even though he's facing difficult times in his life, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. He's worshiping God on the Lord's Day. And he sees a vision. The first thing he sees is a revelation of the glorified Christ. He wasn't whipped or beaten or like I spoke about a moment ago as we were praying. No, His his face shined like the sun. His eyes were like a flaming fire. His feet were like polished bronze. In His hand, He held seven stars. He walked in the midst of seven candlesticks. And He tells John, write the things that which you have seen, That's the past tense. The things which are, that means what's going on right now. 
and the things which are to come. So he wrote about the vision of Jesus that he saw. And then he wrote the things that are. That's Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Don't forget that. Don't skip over that. You need to master. You need to know exactly what's being said. Revelation 2 and 3. Because that's that's really where the, the portion of the book that pertains to us right now. You can know all about the rapture. You understand? You can know all about the Antichrist and the tribulation and the battle of Armageddon and the second coming. But if you're not walking with Jesus Christ today, you're going to find yourself on the wrong side of the fence. I believe there'll be people that know great mysteries of God. Uh, they, they knew the Greek and the Hebrew and they could teach the Word. Maybe they even led others to know Jesus. But they didn't know Him themselves. Do you know what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 23, 24? He, he said that there are going to be people who come that say, we did mighty works in Your name. And He'll say to them, depart from Me, I never knew you. The word knew in the Greek is the word gnosko. And it, it means to know by way of intimacy. It's the same word used between a man knowing his wife and producing children. It's a closeness. That's really what Jesus wants with each and every one of us. Not to just know about Him. Not to know things about Him. Not to know things about the Bible or to be able to quote the Bible or to see how many times you go to church a a, a week. None of that. If you don't know Him. If you don't know Him. All of that's in vain. If you do know Him, I believe you'll do all those things. If you do know Him, you'll be in the Word. You'll be at church. You'll be a worshiper. Because knowing Him and having a relationship with Him will draw that out from you. He deals with the churches. I spoke about it as we were opening tonight. Some of them were really struggling. He encouraged them. Some of them were in infiltrated by false doctrine and and being seduced and led astray. He rebuked them. Told them, get back to what's right. The last picture though, y'all, that we see of the church, Revelation 3, uh, the end of the chapter deals with the church of the Laodiceans. They say, we're rich, we're increased with goods, we really got it going on. Man, look at us. Jesus Christ was standing on the door trying to get in. They didn't even know it. I believe that's a picture of of a great portion of the church in our day. Make sure it's not you. Do you know it's important that when you read the Bible, you don't don't well, yeah, that's talking about them. That's talking about the church down the road. You ever read a verse in the Bible and thought, boy, they need to read that verse right there. Or you ever heard a sermon and said, Boy, I wish they would have been there tonight. They really needed to hear that. Always look at it and say, Lord, what do you want to say to me? Remember Sunday we talked about the man in the book of James? He looked in the mirror, but he immediately forgot what he looked like. Don't do that. Let God's Word deal with you. Let God's Word get you prepared. You you might be able to go reach others as a result of it, but the first thing, you need to look at your own walk with the Lord. In Revelation chapter 4... John is caught up to heaven. He said there was a door opened up into heaven and I was called. He said, come up here. Come up hither. I I believe that is the rapture of the church. I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. I believe the Bible teaches it. I believe the Bible confirms it. That before the great tribulation begins, before Antichrist is revealed, before any one of these horses comes riding out of that scroll, before any of that, before the mark of the beast... The church will be gone. Because, here we go, the the church and Israel are two different entities. You understand that? The, the, The church is not rejecting Christ. The church has received Christ. We've been washed in the blood. He bore God's wrath for us on the cross. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 9 says that God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ. So Jesus took, literally took the wrath of God. You know when Jesus was in Gethsemane saying, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. I promise you, Jesus was not afraid of Roman whips or their nails, their hammers or their cross. Let this cup pass from me. What's in that cup? That cup, that cup contains the wrath of God. 
That cup contains the, the, the punishment. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 10 says that it pleased the Lord to crush His Son for our iniquities. That's what happened on that cross. It's absolutely what happened. So He drank the cup of our wrath on the cross. So when He begins to pour wrath on the earth in a seven year tribulation period... I don't expect to be here because I'm better than everybody. No, because I believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ who took my place on an old rugged cross on Calvary so that I could go free. You understand? And God's God's wrath for me, it wasn't swept under the rug. It was paid in full on the person of His own Son. All right, that's the church. They're going in chapter 4. They're going to heaven. The Father was sitting on the throne. There's a rainbow around the throne. You remember all this? Thunder and lightning coming out of that throne. There were strange looking creatures. Um, the, the King James calls them beasts. But it's really the word Zoan. And I believe these are cherubim or seraphim. Isaiah saw them. Do you know Isaiah chapter 6? He said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. And, and there were those, those, those creatures in the throne room. They had six wings, covered their face and their feet. And they, with two of them, they flew and they, they cried day and night. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. These are created beings, angelic like beings, I don't believe they're angels they're cherubim and they have wings and they, they're in the throne of God and they worship God, those are the four beasts or the four living creatures around the throne were 24 elders sitting on the King James that calls them seats, in the Greek it's the word thronos, it's a throne There are 24 sitting on thrones. Remember, 24 is a representative number. Uh, When David numbered the priesthood, they were broken down into 24 camps. And there were hundreds of thousands of Levitical priests in Israel, but they couldn't all be in the temple at one time. Can you imagine being in a a building in in the tabernacle with 100,000 preachers? (laughs) You know, you, you... You'd really be in for it, wouldn't you? (laughs) Hard enough to deal with one. So they broke them down. They would serve 24 at a time. Jesus promised His apostles, you're going to sit with Me on thrones. Paul writes in the New Testament when he talks about judging. I'm not going to get far on this rabbit trail, but a lot of people, the only Scripture they know is don't judge Me. Most of the time they tell you that because they don't want you to talk about the sin in their life or the wrong direction that they're going. You know, Paul writes to believers in the New Testament at Corinth and said, do you know you're going to judge angels? Do you know the Bible says, he that is spiritual judges all things. Now, if you sit up in church and you judge, well, Coach Rawls ain't really saved. But John's just doing all that. You're wrong for that. That's a wrong judgment. And Jesus said, when you begin to judge people like that, He's going to turn it right back on you. The same stick you use to measure others, it's going to be used on you. But as a Christian, as a believer, you need to judge everything. What's that mean? Do you really need to go there? Do you really need to watch that? Do you really need to be hanging out with them? Do you need to listen to that? Is that good for you? You better judge everything. You better make a a decision not based on the way you feel or what others say, but based on the Word of God. Jesus promised those apostles, those disciples, you're going to sit with Me around My Father's throne and you're going to judge there. I, I believe that these 24 elders, they're representative of saints and the church of all times. Imagine men falling in that garden and being cast out of the presence of God. But now, that's the power of the blood. You understand? Put you on a throne around God's throne in His presence for all eternity. And nobody's scratching their heads saying, what are those men doing here? They belong there because of the blood of the Lamb. They're worshiping God. In chapter 5 of Revelation, the Bible says, John said, I saw a strong angel. 
I don't believe anything in heaven is weak. Everything is strong. Everything is mighty. Have you ever watched a loved one die? And they're so weak and they're so drying up. And they're, they're just a shell of what they used to be. Maybe they're laying in the bed and they're unresponsive. Just laying there. They don't even know that you're, you're in the room. And us, us in our selfishness, we can really want them to stay. I, I hate to say goodbye. I hate a funeral. I, I do. I hate to bury people that I love. I, I really do. But you know, if we could see into heaven, nobody's on, in, on oxygen in heaven. Nobody needs a wheelchair in heaven. Nobody's wrinkled up and old and, and just a shell. No, they're not. They're given a perfect body when they get to heaven. Have y'all seen the picture of that, that tombstone with that little boy leaving, leaving that wheelchair and going to heaven? That makes me cry. <laughs> That's the reality of it. He'll leave that wheelchair. He won't need it where he's going. He'll be made well. He'll be made whole. He'll be made perfect around the throne of God. God, I can tell you, that's the reality. Nobody's sick there. John said, I saw a strong angel. Man, that angel stood up. You know what he said? Who is worthy? The Father has this book in His hand. It's a scroll. It's rolled up, piece of paper. Who's worthy to take this book and to loose the seven seals? John said, I wept so hard because no man was worthy. Remember we brought out the great, great men of God that are in heaven? Not a one of them said, I'll open it. They knew they weren't worthy. They're saved men. They've made it to heaven. Not one ounce of sin in them. Not one bit of unrighteousness marked to their charge. They know I can't touch that book. The Bible says they couldn't even look at it. They searched, couldn't find. And John's weeping. He says... Uh, one of the elders, that's that redeemed church, they've been there. They know what's going on. Comes, taps him on the shoulder. Don't cry, John. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed to open the book and loose the seals. That was Jesus. He said, I looked and behold, a lamb as it had been slain. This lets me know Jesus will bear the marks of the cross throughout eternity. He's proud of those marks. You know what those marks gave him? The title Savior. The title Redeemer. The the title that I fought. You know, kings in the old days would send their troops out to fight and then come back and tell me how it went. Our Christ... He left all of His troops at home. He went and fought all by Himself on a hill called Calvary. Then He went back to heaven, put that blood on the mercy seat, and He sat down at the Father's right hand because He conquered all. He overcame everything that hell, everything that sin, everything of darkness. He did all alone. He alone stood up and said, I'll take that book from you, Father. That's authority. That right there lets you know Jesus is not under the Father. He, he's not like the Father, but just a little bit less. He, he's not a, a, a sub. He's on an equal ground. Our God is three in one. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ. Watch them. There's people that will tell you Jesus Christ is a created being. Jesus Christ is a prophet and a good man. No, He's not. Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. But He's always been. The Bible says that everything was created by the words of His mouth. The whole world's held together by the word of His power. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. That's Jesus. He takes that book from His Father. And as soon as He takes it, it sends off an eruption, like a volcanic eruption of praise in heaven. Those living creatures, they go berserk. All the elders get off their thrones. They have crowns on their head, but they start throwing them in the glassy sea around the feet of Jesus. They start worshiping Him. Worthy. They begin to sing to the Lamb. Worthy to receive glory and honor and blessing and dominion and might. They begin to sing. Uh, They begin to play harps. It begins to erupt. John said, I saw 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. You know what I think? 
Heaven's going to be a loud place. Imagine all these people. I don't know what the math is on it. I don't believe it's a literal number there 10,000 times. I believe it's just a huge multitude. You know what? I hope heaven is a huge multitude. I do. I don't want to see anybody die and go to hell. I hope it's a huge multitude. They're, they're worshiping Jesus. But it's important for you to know heaven is in complete agreement when Jesus starts opening up this book. This is not, it just up to that point, you would think this is going to be a delightful book. It's going to be a children's bedtime story. No, it's not. He begins to open that book. Horrible things begin to happen on the earth. He breaks the first seal. Understand, this is like a rolled up scroll sealed with wax. It's got seven of them in it. In other words, you break one, you open a page. Break two, you have two. And you roll it on out. It has seven seals on it. He opens the first one. A white horse comes riding out of it. He had a crown on his head. He had a bow. And, and the Bible said he went forth to con- uh, conquering and to conquer. We believe this is Antichrist. We believe that this is a political deception. That the whole world is going to throw in their lot with this man. He's going to have charming words. He's going to be very persuasive. It's the best thing. Uh, you know, and we said how the, the, the mice keep going in the trap because they can't figure out why the cheese is free in the mice trap. People are going to fall in lot. The, the government is going to say, we're going to take care of you. Many people are already living like this. Government pays your bills. Government buys your food. Government does everything. And, and they, they'll be afraid to speak out against it because that's my welfare. That's my housing. That's my food. That's, that's everything. Don't speak against the government. It's in America today. We, we, I'm for less government Leave me alone, government. Let me do what I do. Uh, That kind of a government. But there's a lot of people that believe we need more government. And it's already a... I get off on that. We'll be here a long time. That white horse comes riding out. He seems to be peaceful. Everybody's persuaded by it. Who would say anything against this man? He never fired an arrow, but he conquered the whole world. But right after that comes a red horse. Power was given for, to him to take peace from the earth. And he had with him a great sword. Right after the white horse comes a red horse. With murder, bloodshed, people are dying. People are being killed. Right after this comes a black horse. The black horse rides out. He's got a message. A measure of wheat for a penny. Three measures of barley for a penny. Don't touch the oil and the wine. This black horse brings famine. There, there's scarcity. There's not enough. A penny in the Greek is a denarius. It was a one day's pay for a hard day's work. In other words, a man's going to work all day long, hard labor for one loaf of bread. I had a hard day. I'm tired today. I sweated gallons. I can't imagine coming in from it, Coach Rawls. And all that's on the table is a piece of bread. I say to my wife, what is wrong with you? (laughs) Do I look like a man that eats bread for supper? We would complain now. It'd be a ruckus in that house over a piece of bread for supper. But it wouldn't be if that's all you got. That's all there is. Don't hurt the oil and the wine. I I believe it means the rich, they're they're still doing what they do. They don't care. That's why you need to be careful who you follow. Who you allow to speak into your life and persuade you. Lastly, there come a pale horse. He that sat on him was death and hell followed with him. And power was given to them to kill one-fourth of the people on the planet. A pale horse, the word pale in the Greek is the word chloros, which is where we get the word chlorophyll, chlorine. It's a green color. It's a pale green color. If you ever see a pale green horse, run. 
Run the other way. It's not good for a horse to be pale green. It's the color of death. On Him sits a a creature named death. I believe it's a fallen angel. Do you remember in Exodus uh, chapter 12 or chapter 13 when, when God sent the angel of death to strike the firstborn in every house that didn't have blood on the door? I believe it's Him. He comes to kill a quarter of the people in hell. Literally, Hades. It's the place where people go when they die in their sins. When they die outside of Christ, they go to hell. They kill a quarter of the people on the planet. I don't know, obviously, how many people are going to go in the rapture. But right now, there's 8 billion people on the planet. 8 billion people on the face of the earth. That would mean 2 billion people killed by this pale horse. Two billion people. That's two with nine zeros behind it. I did the math. Uh, I, I did it last week. I, I could look it back up in my, in my other notes. But if you killed every person in the entire continent of America, North America, Central America, and South America, from Canada all the way down to places like Brazil, you would still not have enough people to have killed a quarter of the world's population. Do you know America, it has in the mid-ranges of the 300 million. It does, America doesn't even have 400 million people. Could you imagine if everybody in America was wiped out just like that? You, you wouldn't even have but a small percentage of the people that are going to die after this pale horse appears. That's a tribulation. Why do we need to know this? I can tell you, to wake people up. It's easy. you you got no idea how many people have their head in the sand. People that go to church on Sunday, they've got their head in the sand. They, there's no thoughts of judgment. I can have Jesus and live in my sin too. Oh, I took care of Jesus a long time ago. I'm going to live how I want to live and go to heaven one day when I die. But right now I'm going to live my life and do what I want to do. It doesn't, you don't find that in the Bible. It doesn't work like that. Nobody did that in the Bible. It's dangerous ground. I believe that people like that, they're going to be left. They're going to be left. When Jesus comes, He's only coming for people that know Him. For people that walk with Him. You think about it. I see people every Sunday. They hate being in the presence of God. They hate it. Right here in this church, I see it. Can't wait to get out of here. You think God would take you to heaven? People think when I go to heaven, I'm going to go bass fishing with my grandpa. Duck hunting with my cousins. They listen to songs on the radio. Give heaven some hell. When I get up there, I'm going to have a beer with Jesus. You understand, if if that's the way you think and believe, you don't belong in heaven. Everybody in heaven has been saved from that. No, they weren't perfect. Sure, they had struggles. They want the presence of God. They don't want to live that old life. That's the first four seals. Terrible things. Four horses come riding out of that book that Jesus has in His hand. The fifth seal, uh, that's what we read about tonight. He says, I saw souls under the altar that were slain for the, for the Word of God and for the testimony which they held. These are martyrs. These are people who were saved after the rapture. Now, some, some people believe nobody's going to be saved after the rapture. I don't believe that'll be true. I believe, can you imagine if that rapture happened tonight? People that know about God, they know the Scriptures, they know the way of salvation, but they've been playing games or they've backslidden away from God. They're going to know immediately what happened. I told you that story. Back in the 50's there was an evangelist preaching at the church and one morning the gathering was, was a little s- small. I can't remember what happened. But he said back in the 50's you could leave all your stuff. Didn't have to worry about anybody messing with it. Women's coats and purses and men's jackets. Everything was just laying in the seat. And they were back there having service in the Sunday school room. Well one woman came late to church and when she walked into the sanctuary... All this stuff is laying there. 
He said she let out a screech like somebody was trying to kill her in that church. They come running out and she was in the aisle of the church sobbing like you never heard saying, oh, I missed it. Oh, God, I missed it. She was scared to death. I missed the rapture. I saw today a man who used to be a real Bible preacher, a real Bible college professor, mocking the rapture. Mocking it. Saying he thought of a way to make some extra money. He would sell insurance. If you want to go in the rapture, but you're going to leave your kids and your dogs behind, we're going to sell rapture insurance. Making a complete mockery of the things of God. I can tell you, in a, God says in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, when the rapture does happen, there won't be any laughing. People will be wailing. They'll know the reality. I played games. I mocked and I laughed. But God God wasn't laughing. God wasn't playing games. The church goes in the rapture. But people get saved after it. People, oh God. Oh God, forgive me. I know what's coming next. I know enough of the Bible. I know what's coming next. People get saved. There are people that believe that when the church is gone, the Holy Spirit's taken out of the earth. You can't take the Holy Spirit out of the earth. David said, if I made my bed in hell... You're still there with me. He may not be moving like He is in this hour, but God will be here. The Holy Spirit will be here. I promise you, He will be. People are getting saved. But understand this, they're going to be killed for the Word of God and for their testimony. The Word of God and the preaching of the Word, it won't be tolerated on this earth during the great Excuse me, tribulation period. They're crying out for justice. How long, O God, do you not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell upon the earth? And the Bible says they were given white robes. Something that I did want to bring out. In verse 9, it says they were under the altar. There's a strange thing that people preach about called soul sleep soul sleep Catholics call it purgatory you go to purgatory after you die it's all false it's all made up the Bible says Paul wrote to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord you're a Christian you're born again no sooner than you take your last breath you'll be standing in the presence of God You're lost. You don't know Jesus and your life ends. No sooner than you draw your last breath, you're going to hell. You'll be in torment. The Bible says it. Jesus said that rich man died and immediately he was in hell. He was in torment just wanting a drop of water. Lazarus was carried to Abraham's bosom. These souls, he says, they they were under the altar. But if you look in verse 11, they were given white robes. They were clothed. They're talking. They they see. They're aware of what's going on. There's no such thing as soul sleep. They're aware. But God gives them a word or it's said to them that they just need to rest for a season. In, In other words, wait. It's not time yet. Have you ever asked the question, man, when's God's gonna when is God gonna judge this? Have you ever felt like you can't get away with anything? Right? You, you get one step out of the will of God and He jerks the rug out from under you. You land on your face. I know exactly what happened. I got off that solid rock. I went to that sinking sand. You know what that is? That's really God's love for you. I say this a lot. I don't think I've ever whipped anybody else's kids. I did I did actually kick a kid in the shin one time. I thought he was my kid. And uh we we were at church one night after we went to McDon and we went to McDonald's. It was a the, he's a pastor, he's a friend of mine. And his kids came came running around and just headbutted me right in the stomach, Coach Rawls. And I grabbed him by the shoulder and kicked him in the shin and told him to straighten up. I thought it was my boy. And I looked and it wasn't my boy. <laughs> and uh, I felt so bad about it, you know. But what I was saying, I, I, don't, I don't discipline other people's kids because it's not my kid. 
but I do discipline mine. Why? Because they're, they belong to me. And I love them. And I, I have great expectations from them. I don't beat them, but I have taught them how to act and what's appropriate and what's acceptable. And they know that. And if you'll do that to your child, I promise you they'll respect you better for it. And what you say carries weight and meaning. I've seen a lot of parents that say, if you do that again, I'm going to whip you. I'm going to whip you. And they know you're not going to whip them. But if you tell them, straighten up. You know how to act. If you don't, you know what's coming. A lot of times that right there is enough and they'll, they'll respect you for what you say. God is that way. The Bible says that God chastens His sons. He, he disciplines those that He loves. That's why you, you might have friends or family members, they can get away with anything. They can say whatever, they can do whatever, and it seems like money just piles up, good things keep happening to them. You, you can go through seasons where nothing goes right in your life. Why doesn't God do it to them? Why don't He deal with them? It's because they, more than likely, they don't belong to Him, but you do. And through the trials and the tests that you go through, it draws you closer and closer to the Lord. That's why God says, I love Jacob, but I hate Esau. He whipped Jacob every day of his life. He just let Esau do what he wanted to do, and Esau went to hell. Esau built nations that later fought against the real people of God. But Jacob, he schemed, he surplanted his way, but finally he met God who knocked his hip out of socket and Jacob the surplanter became Israel, a prince with God. You see the difference? God dealt with him. God crippled him. But in the result of it, it changed his name and it changed his character. These are wanting revenge. God, how long are you going to let this go on? Just wait a little while because your brethren... They're also going to be killed. In other words, more people are going to be saved and killed in the great tribulation. The sixth seal, it begins in verse 12. This one, this one's incredible. Jesus opened the sixth seal and there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. And the moon became as blood. Stars of heaven fell to the earth. I believe, he says, it's like figs coming off a tree when the wind blows. I believe this is a meteor shower. I do. I've read commentaries and I dug trying to see what, what's going on. What, what's the, the opinion on this? People try to make it allegory. They try to spiritualize it. And I know there are allegories in the Bible. All right, Jesus said, pluck your eye out, cut your hand off. I don't believe he actually meant that. I believe he meant get things out of your life that are leading you to hell. But there are other things that you better not spiritualize. You better not make it an allegory. It's literal. You understand this is the wrath of God being poured out on this earth. This ain't a little tornado that come through or a big tornado. Not minimizing that. That's horrible when it happens. But I'm talking about this is the full fury of God being released on an unbelieving world. I believe verse 13 is a meteor shower. Verse 12, a great earthquake. This is the first of three great earthquakes uh, that take place in the book of Revelation during the tribulation period. Have you all seen some of this stuff that talk about the plates? What are the, what are the plates? The, the tectonic plates? That, that, that they're, they're shifting? Some of them are, are only just this far away from shifting. Have you heard about, they talk about that tidal wave, that if one of them shifts, that tidal wave could hit California and just sweep across America. I heard something uh, over the last couple weeks that were talking about Yellowstone. There's a volcanic mountain at Yellowstone. And they, they were saying that if it, if it were to erupt, the entire United States would be completely shut down. It, there wouldn't be a, a mobile America. That, that's, that's the word that, that was used. Now, I, I just wonder if maybe God has all these things. A scientist is able to see, man, if that plate shifts that far, your world's fixing to change. If the top blows off of that mountain and lava starts coming out of it, this whole world is about to change. Maybe God has all of that in store, holding it back for this great day. 
He says in verse 14, heaven departed like a scroll as it's rolled together. He says the sun becomes black and the moon becomes blood. Again, I would take this very literally. Do you remember when God sent darkness to Egypt? Uh, during the plagues, there were darkness so that they couldn't see uh, their, their hand in, in front of their face. I have some notes about this somewhere. I'm not, I'm not seeing them. Anyway, uh, uh, there was also darkness. Remember when Jesus was crucified on Mount Calvary? Darkness covered the earth. Uh, uh, there, was, there were earthquakes. That there, were, there was even an earthquake that happened there at the... At the, uh, at the crucifixion of Jesus. Listen to this. In verse 14, the second part. Every, every. Everybody say every. Every, every mountain and island were moved out of their place. That's powerful. It's powerful. Every mountain. You're talking about geographical changes. There was a mountain there yesterday. Now it's not. There was an island there yesterday. Now it's not. This is the fury of God being released on the earth. But look, look in verse 15. Look how people react. Before I say that, I, I, I'm not going to get into it, but you, you could jot down in your notes. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Is it okay to think two things at once? <laughs> Like I, I believe one thing, but I also, also see something else, all right? I would not want to bank my salvation that I'll get right with Him after the rapture and then I'll just be killed for it and go to heaven. Because even though I do think people will be saved and they will be, they will be killed and they will go to heaven, we read that, okay? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 talks about people on the earth after the church is gone, how God will send them a strong delusion and they're going to believe a lie because they did not receive the love of the truth, but they had pleasure in unrighteousness. In other words, they they had the opportunity to receive the truth of, of Christ, but they didn't want it. So God, it literally says God will send them a strong delusion so that they will believe a lie. So you see, some, some are going to get saved and they'll be the martyrs that we read about. Next week we'll talk about 144,000 that will end up uh, being martyred uh, in, the, in the kingdom of God. But look here in verse 15. It talks about all ranks of men. Revelation 6.15 Kings Great men, rich men, chief men, mighty men, bond man, that's a slave, a servant. And every free man, that's just a common man. They hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And said to the mountain, fall on us and hide us from the face of Him that sits on the throne. From the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of His wrath is come. Who shall be able to stand? You understand these people know exactly what's going on. I even wondered as I read that, I saw somebody was talking about portals. I didn't get into it at all. I don't know hardly anything about it. Somebody was talking about demonic portals being opened. I don't really get into things like that, but I thought about, you talk about a real portal being opened. I wonder if they could see into heaven. And see the one that sits on the throne. And he's looking at them. How do they know he's on the throne? How to hide us from his face? He's staring at us. He's looking at They know exactly what's going on. I'm not saying that they're actually able to see into the throne. But I'm not, say, I'm not ruling that out either. But I, what I am telling you. They know what's going on. They know something of the Word of God. But understand, what they do, they don't repent. Looks like, you remember Pharaoh in Egypt? Hardening his heart. He could see the power of God. Remember when Moses, he he comes and Moses, you got to do something about these frogs. And uh, Moses said, okay, when? Tomorrow. I heard a preacher preach one more night with the frogs. 
I right, just want to spend one more night with the frogs. You thought he'd say, right now, get them away. What kind of question is that? But he hardened his heart. Do you know in the beginning, as in God's dealing, Moses is dealing with Pharaoh, it says, Moses, uh, excuse me, it says Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh chose to hard. I'm not letting you go. What, what kind of deal is that? I'm not letting my slaves go. Pharaoh hardened his heart. But do you know towards the end of that, it says God hardened his heart. You know what that is? That's a judicial act from God. You had your chance. You had your opportunity to believe. Now you can't believe. It's the hardening of your heart. Have you ever seen anybody harden themselves towards God? Have you ever known God was dealing with somebody? Maybe even you before you were saved. I can remember something happening to me. And I knew God was dealing with me. But you know what I did? Stiffened my neck. Hardened my heart. And I ran on. Things would happen to me. I knew it was God dealing with me. It happens sometimes in situations. Something will happen in a person's life. I don't know how many. I've seen it with my own two eyes. I've heard so many stories as well of people that used to walk with God until that happened. And now their heart is hardened towards God. It happens in trials and in pain that people go through. We're going to preach Sunday about stony ground. Sunday morning I I preached about the seed that falls by the wayside where people walk. It never had a chance to grow. There's another ground called stony ground. And it had a little bit of dirt on top of it. But under it were stones that nobody could see. And the seed began to grow. But the sun come up. Jesus said it was trials and tribulations. And they got offended because of the Word. And it withered up and died. People harden themselves against the Word of God. Your heart can become hard even in church when you don't yield to the Spirit. Jesus said in Matthew 13, the same chapter, talking about the parable of the sower, He was quoting from Isaiah, and He said, He said, make make their ear dull, their heart fat, and their eyes heavy. In other words, they're sitting there hearing the Word of God, if your ear is dull, that means you don't hear like you used to hear. Man, the, the, the Word of God is meant to pierce your heart. But if you sit there and you hear it and you hear it and you hear it, you get numb to it. It's just old yawning, sleepy church now. Your heart, he says, make your heart fat. The word to make your heart fat, it, it means to actually, it's a metaphor that means to make your heart stupid or dull or calloused. Your heart don't feel what it used to feel. People go through this in life. People that have been through, just say, abusive relationships where they they just wanted somebody to love them. I can tell you, a a lot of prostitutes are that way. They they were a sweet, tender-hearted little girl at one time, but they were abused and used by people. Now their heart is as hard as this concrete that I'm standing on. I I believe... uh, it's got nothing really to do with that, but a lot of homosexuals, they, they, I don't believe they were born that way. Somebody mistreated them. A lot of them, they were abused by a family member. They were abused by somebody. They really were. And then the lies of the devil got in there and it created a hard heart. To, a lot of them blame God to, to, to be that way. If they could just see, just come to God. Come to God like you are. Come to God like that. He'll fix you. He'll heal you. He'll deal with your heart. He absolutely will. Hebrews chapter 3 warns. It says, today if you hear God's voice, don't harden your heart. Have you ever had God deal with you about a certain situation? You were convicted. You were broken about it. But you shoved it aside. You keep going that direction. It'll come a time it don't bother you anymore. Be careful hardening your heart. Stephen, in Acts chapter 7. Is that right? Stephen preached in Acts 7? I believe he did. I'm almost positive he did. (laughs) Stephen did preach in the book of Acts. 
And you know, as he began to preach Christ from the Scriptures in the Old Testament, you know what he said to them? You hard-hearted, stiff-necked people. Can you imagine a preacher saying that? Stiff neck. You know what stiff neck means? You won't turn. You won't yield. I, I, had a, I was riding this horse one time. I was riding this horse one time, and we used to go to these horse sales on Saturday night. We'd stay there all night. And my daddy and them wouldn't buy one horse, Chuck. We would take a 32-foot cow trailer, and I've seen them. I've literally seen them have to take a load home and go back and get another load. Horses everywhere. And there was this one particular horse this man was bragging on. You know, they bring him in their ring. If you want to find a liar, go to a horse sale. They bragged about this horse. And boy, I'm excited. I got me this horse right here. Well, I got on that sucker in my mom and daddy's driveway. And he run. He hit that blacktop road and he didn't stop. We run nearly a mile and a half down that road. And I had his head sitting in my lap. I pulled that head around. That's supposed to slow him down, stop him, do something. It didn't work. Stiff necked. I've pulled you all the way around and you're still running that way. That ain't a good feeling. His head's in your lap, but his body, his feet are moving that way. A terrible, terrible feeling. <laughs> terrible place to be. Can you imagine God trying to turn a people, turn you around, turn around, but they won't do it. They harden them, their heart. I've seen people harden themselves. I have. I, I dealt with a man once so hard. I think I told you about him before. He's so old and, and health is so messed up. He can't even walk. He's on oxygen. Living in a a place you wouldn't want to live. Got nothing. And I come to him with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Pled with him about his soul. Wept over his soul. You know what he told me? I don't want anything to do with that yet. He said, I still like to mess around with the ladies. I thought, you can't even get out of bed by yourself. What, what would you do with a lady? Do you know what that is? That's a hard heart. It's a callous heart. I dealt with another man one time. They were literally taking gallons of fluid off of his body every day. He's dying. Heart failure, this is the end of the line for you. I come, pled with him about his soul the same way. I didn't have, I felt led by the Spirit to go there. I did, had nothing, no other reason to go. I, I gave him the most sincere presentation of the gospel, telling him, you're, you're on your way to drawing your final breath. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus, you're going to hell. I told him, I don't believe you're ready to meet Jesus. I believe you'll go to hell this very hour if you if this is the end of the road for you. And Jesus will save you. That's why I'm here. He went from that to immediately talking about light bulbs. Wouldn't, would not even acknowledge what I'd spent so much time pouring into him there that day. I'm crying real tears. This man, I, he's nobody to me, not in my family. I didn't even know him but a short time before this. And you go from somebody pleading over your soul and you know you're fixing to die to talking about light bulbs. I had another friend who went through a divorce, went through a hard time in his life and walked away from God saying, Get out of, walk out of church angry. Angry. And I went to him and I told him about that man that I just spoke of who wouldn't hear the gospel and wanted to talk about light bulbs. And I said to him, I said, you know what's going to happen to you? Your heart's going to end up just like that. And you're going to die and go to hell. And you're going to live a miserable life in the meantime. You know what he did? By the grace of God, turned it around. 
broke at the feet of Jesus, living a complete different life today than he was then. God gives you the choice. He does. But if God's dealing with you, don't run away. Run to Him. I promise you, it doesn't matter how bad the road you've walked has been, Jesus will save you. I sat in the living room with a man very near death. And he told me, he was a, he was a Vietnam War veteran. And he said, God can't forgive me for the things I did in Vietnam. And I said, I'll most assuredly tell you, He will forgive you. And I saw that, that man, proud man, break, call on Jesus right there in that living room. I preached his funeral not, not very long after that. And I was happy to say, God told me a long time ago, don't you ever lie at a funeral. If they're not in heaven, don't you put them there. I was so glad, Chuck, there's no, no need for a lie at that funeral. I've seen it with my own two eyes. His family said he was a changed man after you came, saw him that day. He was much kinder, much nicer, had a lot more love in him since you came that day with him. I didn't do that. Jesus Christ did that. That's what he does. God gives you the choice. It doesn't matter. There's nobody that would say, that, that could honestly say, God can't forgive me. Yes, he can. That's what's in the heart of Jesus. Even the ones that crucified him. I can't think of nothing worse than what they did to Jesus on that cross, the Son of God. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's what's in the heart of God. That's the reason for the Gospel. But anyways, you can see here in this chapter, this, this sixth seal being open, rather than repenting and moving to God, they just want to hide from God. It's a terrible day. There's a day coming. Men may thumb their nose at God. Whatever. They may call you weak for following Jesus and make fun of you. There'll be, there'll, there's coming a day the greatest men in this world will call for the mountain. They'd rather a mountain fall on them, Brother Bob, than have to deal with the Lord Jesus Christ and His judgment. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me tonight? Father, we thank You.